next panelist is Dr. Andrew Weil, who is, I think, a hero to so many of us in this movement and also in the field of health and wellness, those of us who have been interested in it, because he rose to the top, has had several New York Times bestsellers on uh, how to maintain health and keep yourself fit, um, eight weeks to optimum health, spontaneous healing. He is here in Tucson at the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. He's the founder and director and I guess it was a fortuitous breakdown many years ago when you ended up here. Your car, your vehicle failed. And uh, it sort of has changed the way we look at uh, some of the traditional healing uh, methodologies that were dismissed as alternative because there was alternative and allopathic. And Andy had a vision to take these and unite them, stop the war and bring them together in order to treat patients best. Um, He's written the book Chocolate to Morphine, uh, Marriage of the Sun and Moon, and his new book is Spontaneous Happiness. Got it right. Uh, thank you, Quinn. All of the physicians, nurse practitioners, medical residents, medical students who go through trainings uh, at the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine get basic information about medical cannabis. Um, that's at least a start. But I have to tell you that most of the physicians that I come in contact with have never heard of the endocannabinoid system, really don't know anything of the material that's been presented at this conference. So there's a huge education gap out there, and that's something that needs to be remedied. Um, but as I said this morning, education only goes so far, because my experience has been that people hear what they want to hear and don't hear what they don't want to hear. And the problem is not just getting the information out there, it's that uh, our, our population is still very sharply divided in its attitudes toward this plant, and the people who hate it and are afraid of it, are their attitudes are rooted in irrationality and fear and prejudice. I think, um, clearly, I would say to you, there's no doubt in my mind that we're moving toward full legalization and acceptance of cannabis in this culture but it's going to be a very rocky, bumpy road. Uh, but there's no question of the direction that we're moving in. Uh, I think our society has behaved very foolishly toward this plant. You know, this is cannabis sativa. Sativa means useful, the useful hemp. It is hard to imagine a plant that has been more useful to human beings. Uh, it provides a very high quality fiber, an edible seed, a high quality edible oil, a medicine, a psychoactive drug, I mean, that is indeed a useful plant. I think it is very foolish that we have let production of the fiber go entirely to China. Uh, this is an amazing fiber that makes incredible textiles that are now being produced. We've let all of that go to China. Uh, I think it's very foolish that we've let all the food production attempt go to Canada. Uh, these are things we can be doing here in a time when our economy is in such bad shape. You know, this is something that would be terrific. It is really dumb to grow cotton in Arizona. And that is a really bad crop to grow here. It takes a tremendous amount of water. A lot of pesticides are used on it. It's really bad for an already stressed environment. Hemp would be a much better choice to plant here. So, to the sum of hemp, I want to say that we behave very foolishly toward this plant. And I think in excluding ourselves from the uh, medicinal uses of the plant, that's another, that's also extremely foolish. Uh, the medicinal properties of cannabis, I think, are extremely varied, very interesting. A lot of them still aren't proven, uh, but interesting, and it looks like there's a lot of potential there. Now, I also have to tell you that, that I think, as a medicine, there's a lot of challenges to using cannabis. Uh, it's got very peculiar chemistry and pharmacology that's not like drugs that we use in medicine. For one thing, the constituents are completely insoluble in water. I mean, that makes distribution and pharmacokinetics difficult. Um, the, the problem of how to administer it, um, that's a big one. Uh, I said I'm very much in favor of whole cannabis preparations. Uh, if Sativix were available here, I would be recommending that a lot to patients. And I wish you'd all fight for that. You know, it's available in the UK and Canada. And Netherlands and a lot of other countries, we should have access to that here. 
And I'd also like to have access to thermal delivery systems and others for whole cannabis. That if people want to smoke it or use it by the vaporization, that's fine with me. But for medical use, I want to see these kinds of preparations available. Another problem with cannabis as a medicine is that there's a great deal of individual variation in sensitivity to it. And doctors don't like that when it comes to giving out medicines. You now, we like predictable, uniform responses, but that's not the case with cannabis. And my experience is that if a person responds well to cannabis, it might work for them for a wide variety of conditions. So it may not treat conditions as much as it treats individual people. And that's a different way of looking at a drug, too. So you know, that's an option. So I just want to be realistic about the challenges out there in developing this as a medicine. Uh, but I'd also tell you that you know, there, there are areas, there's enough consistent reports and data that make it look to me as if there's stuff there that we should be going after. And I, I would be in favor not only, I mean, I'm using whole cannabis preparations for patients, but I also want to see the kinds of uh, pharmaceutical explorations that go on working with these unusual molecules and how they impact the system in our bodies. And I think there is an incredible potential for developing new drugs uh, from the cannabinoids. And I'll just go through some of the some of the things that look really interesting to me. Obviously, the you know the traditional uses of of appetite stimulation. This we have a lot of ways to ruin people's appetites in medicine, and we don't really know ways to stimulate appetite. That's a good one. The enhancement of opioid analgesia is obvious. I mean, that's great. If you can get by with lower doses of opiates in people, that's a good thing. Uh, opiates cause a lot of undesirable effects. One of them is mental clouding. Um, and for people with serious illnesses, especially approaching end-of-life situations, it's not good to have your consciousness clouded. So if you could use lower doses of opiates by enhancing the cannabinoids, that would be great. I think there's tremendous potential in the neurological. Um, first of all, it looks like there's a, there, there would be the possibility of developing very effective anti-seizure medications that would be much less toxic than those that we have now. And CBD is probably the thing of greatest interest here. But again, whether that's the manipulating the plant's genetics and chemistry to produce CBD-rich strains or other things, or developing analogs of CBD, I don't know, but I think there's something there. Um, uh, cannabis is very effective at relieving muscle spasticity. Uh, I've seen this in, uh, again and again in spinal cord injury patients and people with MS. And I'm fascinated by the reports that I've collected and patients I've seen who swear that cannabis has put MS into remission, uh, often permanent remission. I mean, that's something that should be followed up on. That looks very interesting to me. Um, that's a disease that has a tendency to go into remission, but if we can find ways to, to increase that probability, that'd be great. There is a, a certainly a possibility, I don't know how great it is, that, that cannabis may have some similar effect in ALS, a disease that's now untreatable, uh, certainly something that should be explored. The, um, I think the, uh, the possibility that cannabis might prevent or slow age-related dementia looks very interesting. Uh, ironic, uh, also, in view of the fact that <laughs> have to follow that through. Uh, I, um, I think the, the, uh, the use of it to enhance quality of life in cancer patients is very promising. Now, whether cannabis will turn out to have a cancer preventive effect or, or a, a therapeutic effect in cancer, I don't know. I mean, it's certainly something that should be investigated and followed up on, but there's no question that it can improve quality of life in many people with cancer. Now, one of the areas that, that I haven't heard talked about, but to me, I think has huge potential, is modulation of hunger and satiety. Uh, clearly, the endocannabinoid system is very relevant. And uh, I just came, our center puts on an annual conference on nutrition and health every year. We just had ours uh, last week in Boston. And we bring together the leading researchers in nutritional science to present their findings to the clinicians. And I have to tell you that the latest research on obesity is really depressing. Uh, and it looks as if, if we put on excess weight, the chance that we'll ever get it off is very, very small. And we are, it's, you know, the big problem is the mismatch between our genes and the environment and the way we transform food. But we are victims of our hormones, in particular insulin, leptin, and ghrelin. I mean, these are the hormones that regulate distribution of energy and control hunger in society. And the, the holy grail out there, the 
is to find some way to modulate that system uh, that can allow people to eat reasonably and lose weight or maintain normal weight. And I think, my gut feeling is there is something here in the cannabinoid system which might allow us to do that. And again, whether that's by tweaking the plant and its genetics and chemistry or developing analogs of these things, I just have a sense that's a huge, huge potential out there which needs to be explored. So, um, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to talk to you too much longer. I just, you know, I mean, I've been in this field for a long time and it's been in some ways very frustrating to watch how slow progress has been. Um, as I, I think I said this morning, that when I completed that work in 1968, I thought marijuana would be cannabis, would be legal in uh, five years. Uh, and I did not really s understand at that point the deep rooted irrationality and prejudice that surrounds this plant. So, yes, education is great. We've got to get this information out there. I think the medical health professionals can be key in this, and they are really not informed at the moment. So, you all have to work to. Uh, get your colleagues up to speed about all this. You know, most of them have no idea you know, what you've been talking about here for the past two days, and that would help. Um, but I think the, the other thing, as you said, with social media, what, what we need, there is a cultural change happening. We need to accelerate that uh, by any way we can. Um, you know, when the uh, Dutch uh, instituted their policies on marijuana, I don't know how long ago that is now, um, they said that they set out to make marijuana porn. Uh, and they felt they succeeded at that, that by making it not forbidden and no big deal, uh, that interest in it in, among Dutch youth declined markedly. I mean, there are a lot of foreigners that came uh, But I think that's, you know, I'd like to see Canada become much more boring in this culture uh, and not treat the kinds of responses to the we're moving there anyway. I mean, that is the natural trend, as I said. We are clearly moving toward legalization and acceptance of this plan. Uh, but, you know, some just, <laughs> I'm reminded of the famous remark of, uh, um, uh, of Max Planck when he was asked why, uh, when, and somewhere in 1930, why quantum physics was not more accepted by physicists when it had survived every experimental test that it had been put to. He said, physics changes funeral by funeral. Um, and, uh, you know, so some generations have to pass. You know, some people may just have to die off, and some of those attitudes will die off, and we have to make sure that they don't start up again. Um, I, I would love to see, you know, this plant is so fascinating. Uh, it has, you know, it, had, it made a decision some time long ago to throw in its lock with us, like dogs. Yeah. Really, it's like the equivalent of, a, of dogs at the plant. And you know, other plants don't want anything to do with us and will not let us manipulate their genes. Or, you know, marijuana has always been a camp follower, always been associated with human settlements, and it has made itself very attractive to us by being so useful. And, and it, I think we have not, in this culture, have not been very wise in how we have responded to its invitations and overtures uh, to make the best use of it. So I would really hope to see that change. And isn't it wonderful how well dogs and marijuana go together? The thing with the dog in the park and the joint is a great day, right? <laughs> Dr. Weil, I'm curious, you did this research in 69, 68, and uh, it was published in 69? Uh, published in 68. 68, okay. Uh, did you, you must have wondered how THC works in the body. Did you ever postulate the existence of a cannabinoid receptor system? Uh, did you? Well, I think, you know, I, think, I assumed that there had to be one. Because uh, this was certainly when the when the uh, uh, our opiate receptors were discovered. You know, the, the assumption is that psychoactive drugs work by combining with receptors, and there was no receptor known for THC. Uh, but it's it just seemed to me that there would have to be one, and then if there is one, then there probably have to be 
endogenous production of, of analogs. And that raises, you know, to me, one of the fascinating questions about life in the world is why have why do plants produce molecules that fit receptors in our brains? Uh, I mean, that's a teleological. When you ask that in, in medical school, the professor always says that's teleological, meaning that you know we don't have an answer. <laughs> but, but that's what we want to know. I mean, why is it that way? Uh, why do some protozoa have neurotransmitters? You know, there seems to be a uh, some fundamental underlying interconnectivity of life. Uh, and I think it's no accident that, you know, that there is this match between our receptors and molecules out there on the planet. And that's really interesting. And, uh, you know, now also they, there is a valium receptor in the planet. Where did that come from? I mean, did, did that happen after valium was invented in the lab? We don't have an alcohol receptor. I don't know. True. So that's affecting the cellular level. Yeah. At any rate, this is, to me, that's one of the most interesting connections between forms of life is that the molecules that are common to plants in their brains. Another question I have for you is, you're really the primary school for integrated medical education in the world. Yep. And you get students, I, I believe, from all over the world who come here. What do you find about the attitudes of students? Is there a lot of euphoria when you start to educate them about cannabis? Or is there a curiosity? No, I think today it's curiosity. And, and great surprise when they begin to hear about these findings uh, that have been presented here. Good. And here we are. It's you know a pretty contained group of people. So you see, we we take social media, use that to get the word out. One thing I'm a little curious about. You recall during the AIDS crisis, uh, there was no or very little response by our federal government into producing drugs to treat people with AIDS and there was a group ACT UP uh, they had a motto silence equals death because Ronald Reagan would never mention the existence of this disease and uh, there was a lot of direct action protests and humiliation of elected officials for not seizing the day and acting on our benefit there was a shutdown of the FDA by ACT UP a die-in and I'm just wondering if maybe it's not the time to really get a little tougher with our elected officials and people who are the gatekeepers of biological science and humiliate them a little bit. Well, certainly uh, decisions about availability and uh, uh, of, of drugs should not be made uh, without scientific information. And all of these drug policies have been set without input from the medical scientific community, and that should not be tolerated. Uh, I would also say that for people in this group, I think a very useful step would be to get some presentations of this sort at mainstream medical meetings. So if you could have you know, a session on medical cannabis, or a lecture on medical cannabis, in some of the uh, you know, American Psychiatric Association, uh, American Cancer Society, and so forth. Uh, even if it's just one lecture, to begin getting some of this on the program, so it's not just people talking to the choir. 